Hello? Get your futurist bingo cards ready. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm Tobias. I'm an artist and designer, uh, and the angriest person Simon Ings knows. Uh, and I deal with creating futures from what futurists call weak signals. And I create little worlds that try and remove a lot of the noise and, and obfuscation that technology and structures and ideologies and false rationales put in our way of understanding what's really going on in the world and how we should be reading it. So I take the things that I find interesting, the certain patterns, weak signals again, uh, that I think have an interesting relationship or can bring new light to bear on our reality, and I amplify them to a point of almost ludicrousness, like almost ridiculousness, but they're still fundamentally grounded in reality. And then, like I say, swipe away a lot of the noise, because by doing that, I think you, get a, you just get a different lensing through that fiction of, of what reality is and how it actually looks, because you've disassociated it far enough that we're willing to engage with that fiction. So these are the Mercenary Cubic List. This was a project that was commissioned by uh, Z33 Gallery in Belgium. Uh, it premiered at the Milan Design Salon this year. And it was for their show Design Beyond Production. And they asked me to consider digital labor. And not just digital labor as in things like TaskRabbit or Amazon's Mechanical Turk, but also what digitization meant for the model of capitalism we have, where we have labor and production and consumerism. And I was struck by the amazing conflict that arises where the old model of how you value labor and production and consumerism and the new model of digitization where everything's free and open and easily accessible, in that conflict, the consumer benefits massively. Everything is now free and fast and easier and there's more of it than ever before. Almost your wildest whims can be appeased and yet the laborer suffers more than anyone else in that system. So that you can see that in everything from factory collapses in Bangladesh to the, the crisis of zero-hour contracts and free internships, the unpaid internships, rather, that are plaguing us at the moment. The Mercenary Cubiclist was trying to look at some of these issues. The Mercenary Cubiclist live in the uh, fictional town of Gotham, uh, which is the next mining town in the north of England. And the entire town is subcontracted to a brand new Chinese capitalist eco-city called Desert Heaven. And that means that the entire labor and environmental burden of Desert Heaven is offset to the residents of Gotham. And to paraphrase the film Sleep Dealer, this is the American dream, all of the work, none of the workers. The residents of Gotham, the mercenary cubiclists, play an endless game on their computers that they hold in their arms. And they tag images and videos with terms and, and ideas that they recognize in them. In this scenario, and in the literature I was reading at the time, this would be the last job left to humans once everything was automated. And in return for this job, they achieve points that they can use to buy resources, such as heat and water and light and food and so on and so forth. But there's a catch. There's always a catch. They can only consume the leftover resources of their doppelganger in desert heaven, such that the combined resource use of one citizen of Gotham, one mercenary cubiclist, and one uh, capitalists living the dream in, in China is one person's use. And it, it makes all, all that labor and all that work invisible in the same way that kind of the sweatshop labor or the, the, the unpaid labor that maybe goes into a lot of the lifestyle that we accept is kind of just uncredited and unrecognized. A couple of months after this project opened, we had it confirmed that the NSA was colluding with the technology companies we'd left in charge of our future to spy on us. And I mean confirmed because we really already knew that that was happening. You, you kind of knew it in your heart of hearts that the technology was there, the will was there, the ideology was there. So what Edward Snowden did, he didn't reveal anything. He issued a call for action for us to stand up and do something about it. And it's a call for action that we're incapable of responding to in any real way. This is a great quote from Quinn Norton written in, uh, in light of the Bradley Manning trial. Why wasn't I consulted is the fundamental question of post-network democracy and the fundamental question of the internet to which the state mechanisms have so far applied, who the hell do you think you are? It's basically saying that we don't have a platform in which we can deal with this problem. There's no town square for Google that you can go and protest or go and occupy. We don't share the same language. They exist on a completely different plane. And we don't have a way of dealing with this. And so when it's revealed, or when we're, we're given a call for action, we can't really properly respond to it. I base the mercenary cubiclists in the town of Gotham because it's the same principle you, used by Amazon in how they choose to place their warehouses. They look for a town that has no transferable skills, no transferable capital, mass unemployment, 
upset with local government. They make a promise of future work, leave it to simmer for a few years, and then plop down a warehouse with just less than the required amount of jobs to balance the economy. And that way, you end up with a queue of people all the way outside the door who are happy to work for minimum wage with no guarantees. And in fact, a guarantee that if they take a sick day, they'll be fired. The mercenary cubiclist play a game, because that's kind of what we're doing all the time. Farmville's a particularly heavy-handed example of, of a gamified digital economy where monetization is really at the root of it. But think about YouTube, for example. YouTube don't create any content. They ask you to create the content. They add advertising, and then they feed it back to you. The only payment you get is a kind of social thrill of getting a lot of hits on maybe even a viral video. And the cubiclists are kind of hardwired to their system that they live in. You might have noticed there was a cable coming out of the computer rather than just a Wi-Fi receiver, because that's really how the internet is. That's how it's structured. Terms like the cloud and Wi-Fi and so on exist to kind of obfuscate the heaviness of that system from us and make it feel, like Paul said, that it's someone else's problem. 88.7 uh, Stories from the First Transnational Traders was a very relatively simple project of mine that I did a, a year or two back. And I wanted to really take the neoliberal ideology that bred the 2008 financial crisis and the ones before it and kind of just explode it to a logical endpoint. Say, what if Occupy completely failed and it won? What, what kind of physicality might come out of that? What might we see? So I designed a bank on a boat. Pretty simple. It was a nice idea. And it was a powerful symbol of kind of the ridiculous extent that the Silicon Valley and neoliberal ideology is prepared to go to. We already saw Hyperloop, for example, as a similar kind of technology, I suppose. And this bank on a ship is full of traders that circumnavigate the entire globe in 24 hours at 88.7 degrees. That's why it's called 88.7. And by doing that, they managed to hack the Earth. And what I was interested in was that at the root of a lot of these financial crises seems to be a conflict between the kind of desperation of states to enforce laws based in old time and space and the eagerness of high finance to run away and break those laws of time and space. High finance takes place in nanoseconds across vast distances. Statecraft takes place in years over borders. And on a, on a human level, I was also interested in uh, a lot of the neurobi neurobiology around trading, and, the, and, and particularly there was a book about uh, how half the world is run by psychopaths, and the name of which I've totally forgotten. That was it, psychopath test, yeah. Uh, and so I was talking to a neurobiologist about how uh, addiction to gambling that most high-frequency traders have, and a lot of the traders have, actually fundamentally changes the mind because the mind is elastic. And I was trying to figure out how this might physically manifest itself if the speed and power of these kind of trades continued. And so I ended up with this idea that they might grow horns that would reflect their trading activity, sort of grow and shrink. It's comic, but at the time, we were kind of animalizing bankers. We were putting them down as, as beasts that had destroyed our economy. And I was trying to parody that. Because the major narrative tells us that we're supposed to blame the bankers for, for our crises, for, for the cloud. Well, not, maybe not our crisis. We're doing all right. Europe's pretty fucked. Blame it for their crisis, their problems. But actually, the bankers were just a symptom of the, the marriage of an ideology and a technology. Technology enabling rapid, super high-speed trade, an ideology that says, yeah, this should be the backbone of our economy. And that just gave birth to the bankers. And th through their, their systems and the things like the, the, the massive cabling and things that are required for that kind of trading activity, they're starting to shape our landscape. So this is the uh, fiber optic cables under Manhattan. The building there highlighted is, is 60 Hudson Street. That's literally where the internet surfaces in New York. And before that was where the telegraph surfaced in New York from across the, uh, from across the Atlantic Ocean. And the banks started to kind of levitate towards it because it was the quickest way to communicate back to Europe. And they're still doing that, even with the kind of speeds we've got at the moment. The buildings around that, that building are becoming full of server rooms, full of algorithms doing these incredibly ridiculous trades. And that's now, and this is uh, Google Loon, which is, was the only image I could find. But actually, I'm going to talk about a project by Perseus Technology. They're looking at sending up balloons into the atmosphere that can act as microwave relays between certain trading places. And it would be in a very similar system to this, except they would be static, so they would constantly be floating over your city, relaying, relaying microwave information. And this is a kind of physical image of the kind of algorithms that are at work under this kind of ridiculously high-speed trading. Nanex uh, go around collecting algorithms. They've created a typology of different algorithms, almost like a zoo 
that they try and spot from amongst the soup of daily trades, because there's a constant arms race between the banks to develop the best algorithms. And this leads to massive problems. Last week, the Nasdaq crashed by a third, and no one knew why. And there was a fantastic quote in uh, The Guardian. The complexity of the systems created to support big data is beyond the understanding of a single person. So the system we've created <laughs> to fuel our economy and that is simultaneously destroying people's livelihoods and countries is completely out of control. It's a bit like Terminator, perhaps. But there's a friendlier side to my work. It's not all this type. Uh, this is a new Mumbai. I was beaten to the punch on power mushrooms. Thanks, Maya. <laughs> uh, so New Mumbai was a relatively, again, quite a simple project. I took the idea of a, of a real research project into how you could grow fungus particularly large and then use them to source electricity. But I was, I was interested in uh, where and how this might be most interestingly applied and where and how it might most interestingly live. So I placed it in the slums of Davi, which are, are the slums of Mumbai. And what, what happens in that scenario, what happened in that situation was it didn't just become a, a sort of bonus for them, it actually liberated them as a civilization. It created a micro community around this technology that allowed them to free themselves from the state apparatus that was rejecting them anyway. And this isn't the first time we've seen uh, kind of micro communities springing up, again, to bring up the Koreshans. Uh, usually, traditionally, micro communities have sprung up around ideas or beliefs or religions or whatever. America, you could say, was founded on people running away from Europe to pursue their insane ideas. But, uh, but then once the territory of countries had expanded to consume all these kind of micro communities, these ideologies, these ideologies that were counter to the state, kind of descended into protest movements, which themselves are problematic, because a protest movement or a subculture, whatever it is, can only really exist in the confines of the state. And it's almost like the state or the system or whatever just allows you to protest. And it just says, that's your space. You can do what you like with it. We're not necessarily going to listen to you, and you don't have the opportunity to go and create your own world, but we'll give you space to sort of throw your weight around a bit. And you can look at Occupy here as a, as a great example of this. Occupy is a movement without any sort of doctrine or manifesto. It's just a group of disgruntled people. And that's kind of at the root of the problem for occupiers. They haven't really figured out what they want. They just know that they're unhappy. But then this is quite interesting. This is the Athens Wireless Metropolitan Network. It began in 2002 with a few hundred people on it, but it's now picked up to around 2,000 people on it, I believe, 2,000 nodes. And it's an entirely alternate internet to the one that we have now. And it picked up in the light of the Greek protests and trying to get away from the fact that the internet was constantly censored and also picked up and other networks like this around the world, there's a massive one in Catalonia with 21,000 nodes, are picking up because people are starting to realize that technology can be a territory. It's not just a tool, it's not just a mechanism, it can actually be a space. It can be a world that you can put your own rules on and say, actually, I'm going to reconstruct this and present it as an alternative to the world that I'm given as default. This is from a great recent essay by David Graeber. We are talking about the murdering of dreams, the imposition of an apparatus of hopelessness designed to squelch any sense of an alternative future. And he's talking here about the fact that the kind of feudal capitalist system we have, in collusion with the technological infrastructures we've set up, are existing to, and I quote again, uh, pursue a relentless campaign against the human imagination to try and close off the possibility that we have an alternative to what we have now, which is why when we find out or we, it's confirmed that the NSA is spying on us, we're just kind of silenced into a sort of shocked acquiescence that this is the only choice we have. So I'm going to finish with, with something I wrote in the blog post uh, that went on uh, ARC. As humans, we possess the unique ability to build worlds, and we need to reclaim that power from the people we trusted with it. Thank you very much.